I'm glad that God has placed me here. This is the time that he wanted us to be on this earth for such a time as, as this, as the scriptures say. So we'll, we want to pray for our country, that somehow we get some godly leadership. Um, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, as always. God's going to bless those people who, who join with him to, to, to bless his people. Uh, and then pray for those uh, amongst our number who are still sick or uh, infirm. Father, we thank you, Lord, for, for another wonderful day that you've given, Lord, to us. You've, you've, you've given us to us uh, as a loan, Lord, that we would take this day and be good stewards of it in everything that we do. So tonight, Lord, we pray that you'll speak to us tonight from the, from the scripture. Help to equip us to be ready to give an answer to every man a reason for the hope that lies within us. Lord, I pray that you let um, your peace, uh, Father, continue to pass over Jerusalem. Um, we know that that time, the time's coming on when there will be uh, war and turmoil and strife there, but we always want you know, your, your people protected by you, and Lord, I believe you're going to do that. So we also want to pray for our country, those who lead this nation, uh, that they would be impacted by, by the spirit of the living God to do those things which are best uh, for the citizens of this country and best for your plan. So, Father, we, we love you. We thank you for the word that you've given to us and just pray that we'll rightly divide it tonight. Uh, in Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. So we have um, tonight and then one more week, next week, and that'll finish up our summer session, and then we'll get started on the fall session. And so there's books. Uh, I think everybody's got a book right now. Um, we are still in the, the division they call um, Contending for the Faith in a Secular World. I believe that's what this lesson's in, this whole study is entitled. And this week's is entitled The Problem of Evil and Suffering. And this is a topic that can be very confusing for the Christian who isn't well-versed in the scriptures. Um, we may not have a problem. We, we may understand the reason for pain and suffering in the world, uh, evil. Um, but we need to be able to take that and give it to the world. Because people in your life, unbelievers, are going to, question you. They're going to question God, right? They're going to have questions sometimes that if you're not equipped to answer, uh, then it can be a detriment to your faith. It can be a, an impediment to, to a witness, and we want to be good witnesses at all times. Unbelievers love to throw evil and suffering and pain in the faces of the Christian. What, what do they say? If God was a good God, if, if he's a good and loving God, why is there pain and suffering in the world? All right, and that's a very simplistic question, uh, and, and there's, no, there's not a simplistic answer to that. Um, but they're going to challenge us to answer that, and too many Christians are not able to give a satisfactory scriptural defense of the, bib of the biblical position concerning evil and suffering. We don't want to, we want to be equipped, right? We want to be ready. Uh, and really, until you're born again, you won't be able to fully understand God's answers to the question of evil, pain, and suffering. The believers, the unbelievers that come and ask you, uh, you, you need to give them a good answer, but they're not always going to be able to understand it. And they're not always, because they're not, uh, their eyes haven't been opened, and their ears haven't been opened by the Spirit. And unless we are spiritually led, uh, we're not going to be able to understand the spiritual things that the Bible can do. The Bible is not just a regular book. It's a spiritual book. And, and you have to have a spiritual eye to understand it. Um, we unbelievers are on the outside of the family of God, looking in, and, and they, they're not they're not privy. I'll use that old word. They're not privy to the things that go on in the kingdom. But we are, and we need to be ready again, always, uh, to be able to answer the questions that they're inevitably going to ask. First Corinthians talks about this. The world thinks, and we know this. The world thinks they're very smart. The world thinks they're very progressive and advanced in intelligence, especially over the Christians. They think we're a lot of rubes, I guess. I don't know what word you'd use. We're, we're like the Galileans were. They weren't very well thought of in the day. Um, but in 1 Corinthians one twenty seven, the scripture says, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. God delights in using unlikely scenarios and unlikely people. He delights in using weak vessels like we are to overcome the world, all right? 
as weak as we are in the flesh and as sometimes as weak as we can be in the spirit, God has given to us everything we need to do that, that we need to overcome Satan, right? We are able to overcome a, a being whose power is without limit, I mean, without limits as far as we're concerned. But God has chosen us to be bearers of his word in this world. Uh, and the world doesn't understand that at all. The world thinks the more degrees you have, the more education you have, the more, more years you've been to college, the, uh, the smarter you are, right? And you have the, all the answers to the world's problem. And the more and more I see it, it seems like the more people go to, to college, the dumber they get, <laughs> I, I'm, to be honest with you. They just, it seems like there's a lot of foolishness going on in the world of education today. So um, the first part of our lesson this, this, to this evening is entitled, Sin Brought Dysfunction. Uh, and we start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And behold, excuse me, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So we have here uh, the end of the creation narrative, how God created everything. Uh, six days it took him, or he, he took, I should say, six days um, to create everything, uh, all the heavens and all the earth. And at the end of each day, he looked at what he had created and said, it is good. But at the end of the sixth day, when everything was complete, he said it was very good. All right, and there, there's a difference between very good and good. When God finished his creation, he declared everything was not just good, but very good. He made the earth and all the life on it exactly how it was supposed to be. All right? And there is, there's even controversy amongst so-called Christians. I'll tell you, God made everything the way he designed it to be. All right, let's always remember that. And he said that it was very good. If you remember this, I know we all do. Goldilocks and the Three Bears. I love the story. I used to tell it to my kids. And you know how it went. Goldilocks went into a place she shouldn't have been. She was trespassing in someone else's house. And today she'd get arrested and thrown in jail or whatever. But she began to partake of certain things in the house. And when she got to the baby bear stuff, it was always just right, right? The porridge, Papa Bear's porridge was too hot. Mama Bear's porridge was too cold. But Baby Bear's porridge was just right. And that's how God created the earth. Everything was just right when he was done. Um, <clears throat> there was nothing lacking. Excuse me. Nothing missing. Nothing was deficient. Everything in the creation and about the creation was perfect. It's not like that today in case... You haven't noticed. Things have changed somewhat since the creation. And so Genesis chapter 3 uh, instructs us about that change or the causation, I should say, of the change. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. All right. So, we're very familiar with this scenario. Eve is in the garden. The serpent comes where Eve is, and he begins to ask questions or to, to challenge her in a certain way. Um, so remember the title of the series, we're in Defending the Faith in a Second World. This conversation that Satan had with Eve is repeated every day by unbelievers in this world, all right? They're always saying, well, God didn't really mean what he said. They're always going to say that. Uh, there may be different 
variations of the same theme, but it always boils down to the same thing. The world questions what God has said, all right? And the, the Christian uh, has to be able to answer that question. <coughs> we will see in the coming verses that Eve was not prepared to defend the faith that she was given. She didn't have a whole lot either, right? God didn't put a whole lot of burdens upon Adam and Eve. It was really one thing. Here's the one thing that you've got to trust me and believe me for. And Eve was not able to defend that, that word that God had given her. The world will attempt to cast doubt on God's word, and we can never, I capitalize that, we can never compromise on the truth of the Bible. If you see um, the, the culture that's around us, um, they're they want certain things to change, right? They don't like the way things are. And so they're out there, very loud voices, and, and wanting things to change. They're wanting us as a nation to compromise on the founding beliefs that this country was built on. And we've seen governments and, and organizations, businesses have capitulated to those demands. They've said, okay, we'll give you what you want. But if you've noticed, They've, they're never satisfied with what we've given. Not what I've given, but what this country's given. <coughs> they want more and more and more. As soon as the world knows you're going to compromise your message or your beliefs, they're going to keep pushing you until you completely come over to their side. And so that's what uh, Satan wanted to do uh, in the case of Eve. We can't compromise on God's word because his word, as we're taught uh, by the doctrines of the church, it's inerrant, all right? It's infallible. Inerrant means it's without error. Infallible means it will all come to pass. It will not fail. And the world will say, like Satan to us, well, yeah, God did say such and such, but he really didn't mean it, all right? And it could be anything. I mean, again, you look at the doctrines in the Bible that the world has come against, things at one time that we thought would never, ever change. Whoever thought that they would, that, that marriage would go from a man and a woman to two men or two women, whoever thought that it would, we would come to a time in society when they would say, well, you know what? A man's not a man and a woman's not a woman. You know, there, we live in times where the world, I, I say they're crazy, but they're really challenging everything that you find in God's word. And Satan, in his way with Eve, challenged everything that God's word had revealed to Adam and to her. And so the problem was Eve began to listen to him. All right. And she went along with his challenge to God's word. Uh, when the woman saw, all right, so before Satan, and there's a lot of very, we could go into very much detail about this encounter in the garden, and we may a little bit. Um, there's a lot of things she never knew or never understood until Satan began to bring these things up. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Until Satan challenged the authority of God's word, Eve never really even paid attention to that tree. It was in the midst of the garden, right in the middle. They went past it every day, I, you know, you, one would assume. Uh, and, and because God had said that this is off limits, they never even considered it. But when, when, when the enemy came in, and challenged the word of God, challenged the authority of the word, challenged the inerrancy of the word, then things changed in, that, in the way that Eve viewed God's word. So she began to look at the tree. All right? A seed was planted within her by Satan. And when she saw, oh, that is a beautiful tree. It's pretty. It smells good. The fruit, uh, I can see the, you know, the juice is dripping off the fruit. It's very good to eat. And so she, she gave in to the lie. She compromised on what she believed, and she, she partook of the fruit, and then she uh, gave to Adam, and he also ate. And when they did that, <clears throat> Scripture says that the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, 
and they sewed fig leaves together. <coughs> I'm going to go get a cough drop. And made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Now God, he knew where Adam was. And Brother Spratlin just preached about this uh, this past weekend. Uh, he, he knew everything about Adam and Eve. God often asks us questions, not so that he knows the answer to it, but that we'll know the answer to it, right? That he'll provoke a response from us when he asks us certain questions. And Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And then God said, who told you, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man <laughs> said, uh, it's not funny, but he, he, was, he was trying to deflect um, God's gaze away from himself to the woman. And, and the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And then the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, she also deflected God's gaze away from her and said, um, <clears throat> And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, or the serpent fooled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life, and I will put enmity, or division, uh, tension you could call it, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bru his, bruise his heel. And unto the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. And sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. When sin entered God's perfect creation, when God created everything, it was good. It was very good. It was just right, as we say. But sin entered and immediately began to change the way that we relate to each other and how we relate to the creation itself. The whole dynamic began to change because of disobedience, because they, they, they disobeyed the word, the one law that they had. They broke it. And whenever you break the law, there are, ram there are consequences. There are, ram there are ramifications that happen. Um, we live in a society where the laws are broken all the time. And you don't see the, the consequences all the time because a lot of these laws are ignored. But God will not ignore the laws that he's established. He won't ignore the laws that he's put into place. He will make sure that they either get obeyed or that there's a punishment for not obeying them. So... Whereas the woman at one time was going to give birth to children in joy and in, in relative ease, I'll say, the sin and the curse, this is what we call when God began to curse them. Instead of that, her childhood, her childbearing became labored, right? All you women who've had children know it's labor. It's not easy. I don't know. Not many women that I know of in my life have had easy childbirth experiences. Um, and it wasn't supposed to be that way. God did not create that to happen in that way. But that's what sin brought. When Adam, his one of his, and, and really when you look at, the world looks at women, motherhood we'll call it. They don't look at, they don't, it's not valued very highly to this world. I think motherhood is valued greatly to the Lord. 
women are the only ones, am I on TV? Women are the only ones that can have children, all right? God created it that way. And it's a glory to the woman and a glory to God because the earth could not be filled with little images of God unless the woman can bring them forth in creation. So God values uh, that childbearing very highly. Adam was put there to do another. He, he was there to work, right? He was there to, 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 to be a husbandman to the, to the garden, to grow things, to gather in the fruit. And it was supposed to be easy. They were, living, they were living in a garden where all you had to do, basically, was pluck the fruit. I'm not sure what Adam had to do in, in, in between times. I'm, I'm not sure that it was very much work, really hard work for him to do. But that all changed also. When he disobeyed, God changed that relationship between man and, and his creative part of the world. Uh, and so it also changed the relationship, if you'll notice, between Adam and Eve. Adam blamed her. All right. Um, and then it says part of this curse is that the, the woman, <clears throat> she's, he, said, he said to Eve, thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. And some commentators have said that this was the woman, that this phrase means that the woman wanted to have rule. She wanted to usurp, right, the, the natural um, headship of the man and take it over. Again, and we do see that. We see a lot of tension at times between men and women in, in marriage relationships where it shouldn't be. Again, if the man loves the wife as Christ loves the church, then the wife will submit to the husband. And it's a beautiful relationship. That's how God intended it. That's how it should have been. But sin came in again and destroyed that. And of course, ultimately, finally, sin led to death. That's the final outcome of sin. Uh, the wages of sin is death, the scripture says. And so, <clears throat> the fur and so sin entered in in the garden. And the further we get away from the original sin, right, the further down the, as the years go by, the effects of this dysfunction become multiplied, right? Uh, it, it's worse and worse and worse and worse. If you remember in the early, in, in the book of Genesis and even in, Ex, in, in the book of Genesis, uh, people lived a long time, 800, 900, 7, 8, 900 years. They lived on the earth and sin changed all that. It began to greatly shorten the lifespan. It, it brought, I don't believe, I know that sin and sickness wasn't here until sin came in. I mean, sickness and ill health wasn't here until sin came in. Again, God didn't design us to be sick, right? That's what sin began, that was the fruit that sin began to bear in our bodies because of it. Uh, where there was once nothing but joy and peace in that garden, Sin brought sorrow and division. Sin never lifts men up, but it always brings them lower and lower and lower until it's hard to dis distinguish between us and the animals of the creation. I'll tell you, we live in an era when men, when I say men, I mean mankind, lives like the animals do, almost as if they have no restraints on the things. One of the characteristics that God has given humans is that we can restrain ourselves from doing base things, if you, if you use that word. Animals have no restraint, right? They do whatever they want to. But men, mankind, should have some restraint, a capability to restrain themselves. And it seems like today's, in today's culture, there are no restraints anymore. Everything can happen. Then, our next section, it says human nature, sin, a corrupted human nature. Psalm 51.5, this is David writing. He says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Um, the world doesn't like verses like this. I'll, I'll be honest with you, the world doesn't like many verses of the Bible. Very, very few, but they certainly don't like verses like this. Uh, the world will say that mankind is born good, right? We're all born good. We're all born with great potential. That we're, that we're not at fault for the things that we do, right? Mankind says all those little kids that are born, they're, they're little angels when they're born. 
But anyone with any sense and who's raised more than one child will know they're not angels. You know, my three children, they were all different. Uh, but they all knew how to sin at a very early age. I did, we didn't teach them that. It came naturally to them because of sin and, and changed that relationship. The world doesn't buy into that, right? In the old days, uh, <laughs> I know I'm old now because when I was in school, I got whipped. Anybody else get whipped in school? Just Alicia, how about you? You're, you're probably good all the time, aren't you? Oh, okay. But they were whipping kids in school when you were there, right? Okay. I got a few, all right? I got my first whipping in first grade, and I got my last in seventh or eighth grade. I did learn. It took me a while, but it didn't take me long to, to get that first whipping. Nowadays, they don't even want, I guess you can't even really touch kids in school, right? Um, there's no discipline, all right? It, because there's nothing, those kids are good. They're angels. There's nothing wrong with them. Um, I took the whipping in school because I, I, got, I got a choice when I was in, you know what? I'm, I, I told a story. My last whipping was in ninth grade, high school. Uh, I got a choice. I was, I was messing around in class, and they said, you can either stay late after school or you can get licks. And I knew if I stayed late after school, my dad would say, why did you stay late after school? And I'd get more licks from him. So I took the licks and went to go home. I got to go home on time. So it was ninth grade. <laughs> um, but the world says, okay, the world also says, you know, we're, we're born good. We have, the, we have this great potential inside of us. Um, we're good people. Uh, it's not my fault. It's just the way. So when something happens, so in this Psalm, Psalm 51 is about David and his experience with Bathsheba, right? We, we know the whole scenario there. He, he sent her husband, he, he murdered her husband basically uh, because he had an adulterous affair with her and he wanted to cover it up. But he didn't blame anyone but himself. That's what David, and that's, there's a difference between that attitude and the world's current attitude, which says, I'm not to blame for these bad things that I've done, all right? Uh, it's, it's the way I was raised, okay? I was raised with, a, with parents who beat me every day, whatever, whatever it is. Um, it's the injustices of society that have, have, have put me down and made me do these bad things. When we realize, like David did, that we were born in sin, uh, then we can begin to cry out to the Lord for his mercy and his grace. All right? Again, this, the world says, I did, it's not my fault. The, what's that? The old uh, comedian said, the devil made me do it. I always want to blame somebody, <clears throat> but God says we've got to own up to the fact that sin has changed us. I believe Adam and Eve were born, were created sinless. They were. And had they not f f fallen in the garden to sin, their children would have been born sinless. But they weren't. All right. Sin began to, sin was a birthright that Adam passed on to every one of his children. It was part of, it was, it was a, a dark inheritance, so to speak, that, that we all have received from, from our father, Adam. Isaiah 64, 6 goes even further. <clears throat> it says, but we and when, when David said, uh, in sin did my mother conceive me, he didn't mean his mother was a, his birth wasn't sinful, but she was a sinner and, and his father was a sinner and that sin followed him through, through the conception. Now Isaiah says in 64, 6, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. There is none that calleth upon thy name. He's crying out to the Lord that stirreth him up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. And then in, in Mark, the Lord himself says, Mark 7, 20. They were, <clears throat> the, the Pharisees were, were, had seen Jesus and his disciples and how they ate. And when they ate, they didn't do all these ceremonial washings that the, the Pharisees did. When the Pharisees, before they ate, they did all sorts of things to clean their hands, multiple washings to make sure their hands were completely clean before they partook of the food. And they asked Jesus and his disciples, why don't you wash your hands like this before you eat? And Jesus' response is, that which cometh out of them, he said, it's not that which goes into the man that defiles you. 
But he says, it's that which cometh out of the man that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. I tell you, this, this is a laundry list of bad things. All these things Jesus said, all these evil things come from within and defile a man. It's not what you eat. It's not what you drink. It's not even the TV shows that, that you watch. Because guess what? Sin's already there. It's not even the devil. The devil really, God's going to prove this. Uh, when the millennial kingdom begins, we know Satan is bound for a thousand years and cast into a pit, all right? And the world for a thousand years will not be tormented by Satan or his demons. And, God, and at the end of that thousand years, men are still going to rise up against Christ. They're still going to rise up to defeat him. Uh, and I think that's God's way of proving, you know what? No one can now say the devil pushed me to this. It's inside of us. Scriptures say the heart is deceitful, wicked, right? Who can know it? The Lord knows it. The Spirit knows it. And we know it as Christians. The world does not know this. The world, the world hates verses like this. No, we're good. We are good people. How many times have we seen that mass murderer or serial killer? His parents are saying, well, he was a good boy. His neighbors, oh, he was a good guy. We never saw it coming. No, that man was evil. There was something in him that caused that evil. Um, but they'll blame anything nowadays uh, for the evil. They'll, they seldom blame themselves. And the world doesn't, doesn't want to do that. Yeah, once again, verses like these will actually cause the world to get angry. Sinners, it's not funny, but sinners don't like being called sinners. And it makes them mad, right? It makes them mad when you call us. There can be two responses. When, when the gospel is preached, for instance, people can get mad or people can get saved, right? The Spirit speaks to his heart. He's going to realize that he's a sinner. When I heard the gospel, when I was at Bible, uh, in Bible camp, it, 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 I knew, I mean, I was 13 years old, but I knew that I was a sinner. And I knew I was going to hell if something didn't change in my life, and, and I gave my life to the Lord back then. Um, but most of the time when that message is preached, people don't like it. And they'll get angry at the, at the, at the preacher. Uh, this, they're mad at the one who preaches against sin. And they're mad at a God who punishes sin. They don't like the fact that sin's going to be punished. The reality of hell is certainly an idea that makes them angry. Every, all these celebrities who, who, who die of anything, and a lot of it's drug overdoses or... You know, certain a certain lifestyle that doesn't lead to long life. Uh, when they get to their funeral, oh, they're singing, they're ain't, they're singing heaven now. And I got news for them; they're not, more than likely, unless they gave their heart to the Lord and were born again. A lot of these people are going to wake up, and, and they're going to realize there is a heaven, there is a hell one day. But for right now, the world hates the idea of a hell and of a God who punishes sin. The spirit of this world wants to convince you that sin either doesn't exist or that it doesn't matter very much. They're very good on downplaying um, sin and, and, and evil behavior. After all, the world will say, I do more good deeds than I do bad deeds, and that should be worth something to God, right? And that's we see this in certain religions. They say, you know, you do more... That's, that's the way they think they can get into heaven. Um, they just don't know the Bible because the Bible says in Isaiah, all your righteousness are as filthy rags. All right? And, and that's what, how God sees our righteous deeds, the things that we call righteousness. What he sees as, as, as so the scripture, so we would say, how in the world then? Can we make it into heaven? Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. Right? Because it's not our righteousness that gets us into heaven. It's, it's Jesus' righteousness. Verse, uh, Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Um, have you ever heard... There's a hypothetical question that, that comes up every once in a while. Maybe you've heard... I know I've heard it. Maybe you've heard it. 
the question goes something like this, and it can be a different question, a little bit different. It says, what, what's going to happen? Or Brother Rick, what's going to happen? They don't call me Brother Rick. They call me Rick. What's going to happen uh, to those natives in the middle of the African jungle who've never heard of Jesus when they die? Are they going to go to hell? Are they going to go to heaven? All right. Well, if they've never heard of if they never, if they weren't born again, I, I usually... I usually don't tell them this answer, but if they're not born again, they're going to go to hell. We know that, right? Jesus answered a question very similar to that to some of the people around him. Luke chapter 13, verse 1. There were present at that season some that had told him, told Jesus, of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So there was a, an event that happened. It was a time of whatever sacrifice it was, whatever, <coughs> excuse me, whatever feast that they were celebrating. And a group of Galileans had come to offer sacrifices. And uh, for some reason, Pilate had killed them, right? Here they are offering their sacrifices, and he, they were killed in the act of offering sacrifices to God. And that's a very, it's an evil thing, right? It's not a good thing when you, when you kill godly people who are trying to, you know, to do the right thing, to worship the Lord. And so there were people there who, who didn't understand how that could happen, and they asked Jesus about it. They asked the right man, right? They asked him, what about those men? And Jesus answering said unto them, suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? So Jesus said, do you think because that they were, they were punished, like that this punishment came on because they were great sinners? All right, he says, um, I tell you no, nay. But that except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. Or those 18, and Jesus is going to tell another story that we heard about. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? Somebody might say, you know what? 20 years ago on 9-11, 3,000 people died when those twin towers fell. Where was God when that happened? Are all those people in heaven? Right? And that's really that's a question not meant to really get an answer. When people ask you these questions, they really don't want an answer. They're really trying to deflect. They, they, don't, they don't want a relationship with God. They want a reason to blame God, right? And so Jesus said there was a tower at Siloam that fell, and 18 men died in it. Do you think they were great sinners? No. But he says, except you repent. You're going to perish just like them. So Jesus says, you know what? It's not about that native and deepest, darkest Africa. It's about you. All right? It's about a personal race. Don't, don't ask about anybody else. Ask, what must I do to be saved? Right? Because, again, I've, I've had this question in different forms or different ways. People have asked me that. And that they're, not, they're not looking for an honest answer. They want to blame God for some reason. So Jesus said, don't, don't push it on anybody else. Examine your own life. And, and unless you repent, you're going to be like them. Um, men are prone to deflect attention from their own sins and instead point to someone else's misfortunes, right? Uh, Romans 5.18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, even so by the righteousness of one. The free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, Jesus, shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness and to eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. I love this little verse here. You know, the scriptures in the New Testament compare Adam and Jesus, right? The first Adam and the last Adam, they call it. The first Adam was in the garden who disobeyed the Lord. The last Adam is Christ. And that's why we've, I've, I've talked about this before, that when Jesus came to the earth, he was fully God and fully man, right? If you, if you cut him, he bled, right? If you hit him, he would bruise. And we know that. Um, and when he walked on this earth, he was walking like Adam should have walked in that garden. 
He, everything he did was in obedience to God, obedience to the law, and in submission to the Holy Ghost. At, Jesus was completely led by the Spirit. And what he did, he did in his humanity and not in his deity. And, and to me, it makes a big difference because it tells us, I can walk like Jesus did. I can be like Adam should have been if I let God, if I let the Spirit of God move me, if I listen to him instead of listening to the world, right? I can do these same things. We have been given, when we're born again, we've been given the ability to live perfectly. We don't often do it, but we have that ability to do that. And so when Christ came, he fulfilled everything that Adam should have. And that's how, that was part of the plan, to, to, for, he, for him to walk like a man and, and do these things uh, and, and to, to show, and to bring, again, to bring that eternal life back to the earth where it should have been. In the garden, Adam and Eve had the potential to live forever. Because there's another tree in that garden, the tree of life. And all they had to do was partake of that tree of life and they would have lived forever. God designed Adam and Eve to live forever in those earthly bodies, all right? Sin changed it all. Christ came to bring it all back. <clears throat> Romans 8, 18 says, and the final section that we're starting here is the, it's called the triumph of God's justice. And again, the world needs to, we need to know these things and we need to let the world know these things because the world needs to know these more than we do. We already know the, the truth, right? The world needs to know this also to know that there's a hope. And so this is called the triumph of God's justice. God is a just God. God's a loving God. He's a merciful God. He's a gracious God, but he's also a God of justice. His justice will happen. Romans 8, 18, Paul says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy, worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. The reality of sin is that it has nearly destroyed this world. If you, you can look around, it's almost destroyed. Um, relationships between men and women, almost destroyed. Uh, even the environment itself, by, by, by certain ways that we live, have, have really taken its toll on God's creation. Um, the further away that we get from the garden, the more pain and suffering that the world experiences. The Bible also doesn't pretend that everything's okay, right? The Bible is a book of truth. It's not a fairy tale. Uh, it's not a feel-good book, even though some preachers only preach the feel-good parts of it. It's a book that tells it like it is. Paul says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present age are not worthy, worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. But Paul knew suffering. He says, we're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, Jesus said, you're going to suffer if you're my disciple in this world. And suffering is not good. It's, we don't like it. It hurts. Uh, it, there's, but there is good in suffering because God has intended and designed suffering to make us stronger uh, or more, I, probably ideally to make us more reliant upon his strength instead of our own strength. And Paul says, though, even though I suffered a lot, Paul suffered a lot for the gospel, for the sake of the gospel. He knew that it was nothing compared to the glories of heaven because Paul had also seen great visions. He was taken up into the third heaven, the scriptures say. So he, he knew the glory that awaited him, uh, but he also knew he had to wade through all this mud and muck and mire down in this world to get to that glory. He also said, we know that all things work together for good to, to them that love God. It also doesn't say all things are good, because we know that's not true. Um, Sister Lisa gave a testimony Sunday about some of the struggles she's gone through in her life. It hasn't all been good. It's been painful. But it has made you a better Christian. It's made you a stronger person. God has, has used those difficulties, those sufferings and those trials and those pains to make you a better person. You're more, I, I think you're more reliant on him now than you were back then, all right? And that's good. It's not always good when you're going through it, but it works together for the things that are good. I love it when Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Joseph suffered 
almost like Christ did, right? In many ways. I mean, he was, he was, I don't know if he was beaten, but he was in prison. Uh, they told lies about him, all right? He was forgotten. He was abandoned. He was forsaken. But God brought him out of all that. He was, he was there for years. I mean, he was a young lad when he was taken away into captivity, away from his parents, away from his family, away from his home country. And he went into a strange place. But through it all, God had designs for him. And he saved not only Egypt, but he saved the nation of Israel. He, 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 was, he was an important part of that growth of that nation. Uh, but he had to suffer a lot for it. But it worked together for good. Then he, Paul goes on and says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sore. Paul had known all these things. As it is written, for thy, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. But then Paul says, nay, or no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And in the, in, in, when the battles of life, when it seems like the enemy is going to beat us, you can know that you're more than a conqueror and through Christ Jesus. For I am persuaded, Paul said, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Sin has brought all these perils to our life, to this world where they should never have been. Again, this world today could have been, could, this world could be like the Garden of Eden today, but sin changed all that. Uh, the world doesn't understand that. The world, they're putting their hope and their faith in this present world. And, and I can understand how disappointed they are when they see all these uh, natural disasters, as, as they call them, or climate change that goes on. And they feel helpless to do anything about it because you know what? They are. They're really helpless to do anything about it. If, if they trusted God, if they knew his plan, it helps you make it through these tough times. Because none of these things, church, will be a, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. If Christ is in you and me, We'll never be separated from God, right? As long as Christ abides in you and we abide in him, we are with the Father. So uh, that's something to hang on to. Um, so is there a hope for this world, right? We, we want to do all these crazy things. So climate change is the newest, is the latest thing. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s, we are actually in danger, that the scientists say, it, of entering into another ice age. Global cooling was the problem in the 70s and 80s, and now that's changed to global warming. Um, and so people are doing, we, we want to do crazy things to stop them, right? We want to, we, and, and people are, they're willing to let teenagers run the world because they think they can have a solution to these problems. And it's, it's an insane thought, because as we know, Sister Lisa, can any of your teenage grandkids run the world? <laughs> I don't think. They might think they can, right? And they could run it in a certain way, but it wouldn't be good, more than likely. Um, but when people are separated from God, and when people reject God's word and his plan, this is what you get. You get a world that's desperate, a world that's really, the world is hopeless, because they have no hope unless they find their hope in Christ. We found ours. I mean, we know, we know, you know Christ in me, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Uh, the world has, doesn't have that hope, so we, we, need to, we need to make sure we don't compromise uh, the word. We don't compromise our faith. We don't compromise our walk or our testimony because there's a new day coming. Revelation chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. 
And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Right now, pain and sorrow and death and tears are here. They're the pre that's the way the world runs right now, all right? We've all cried. We've all felt pain. We've all felt sorrow. We've all felt loss in some way. Um, and, and, and it makes us, you know, it makes us long for a new world. It makes us long for heaven. I don't know about you. I want to, heaven, this is a picture of when heaven comes down to earth and everything changes. It says God himself is going to be here. He's going to be tabernacling, living on this earth. And I, God, I, I don't know if he's going to do this or not. But I imagine, I like to imagine that God is going to, that we're going to have a, that there's going to be a garden on this earth. And God's going to go in the cool of the day in that garden. He's going to walk with us and talk with us. And we're going to have that communion that Adam had and Eve had at one time before they lost, before they uh, counted it as not very important and, and cast it away. It's going to come back to this earth and, and the garden is going to cover the earth, I do believe, in some ways. And God's going to be there with us. God's going to type, wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, hallelujah, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall be, there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, and this is, in my Bible, it was in red letters. So this is Jesus speaking. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, this is John, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And I tell you, the world doesn't believe in truth. They believe in, 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 in their truth. They believe in, it's like Brother David, it's like, Brother David, I, I believe in my truth, Brother Rick's truth. And you can believe in Brother David's truth. You know, that's foolishness, right? There is no truth unless it's God's truth. Um, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. The word is the, is the truth that we need in this world. And that's why the world is like, it's, it's been cast adrift because they've forsaken the word of God. They've forsaken the Bible. So there's no more. It's like, they, it's like they were, there was an anchor. The Bible is an anchor for the soul. But they've cut the rope because they don't like that anchor anymore. And now they're drifting in a, in a crazy world, in a, in a storm-tossed sea. And, and there's no way to, to, to save themselves except to get back to that anchor, which is the word. These words are true and they're faithful. God, Jesus said, my words are true and they're faithful. They're going to cut, they will come to pass. And by faithful, he means they're infallible. He said it and it's going to happen. So um, the world needs to know this. And it, more than any time in this world's history, they need to know that there is a hope and there is a future. Uh, there's a new world coming that's going to be way different than this, this world that we see all around us now. <coughs> Any questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. And the Bible says the truth will make you free. Right? Right. The world isn't free. The world doesn't know the truth, and they're in bondage to the lie, right? The lies of this world have, have held them in bondage. Um, the God of this age has, has blinded the eyes of people that they might not see the truth. You know, he's, he's cast a, a curtain over a lot of this, a lot of this, the population of the world so that they can't even see the truth of the Bible. It seems so, it's obvious to us because we've, you know, the veil's been taken away. And we've gone through that curtain. And God's brought us in. And we know all these things. That the world, again, they're desperate. You see, again, we just look around this country. And you're going to see the desperation of people who don't know God. And who, who, who are desperately seeking something other than God. They're going everywhere but to the Bible and to the Lord. Right? And they're never going to find the answers that they want there. You've got to come back to that throne where, where the faithful and true one sits. All right. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much that you are faithful, that you are true, Lord, and that you have um, you've ordained a church, Lord, that, that is going to make it to the end. It's going to be uh, with you eternally. 
in a, in a great place. So, Father, I just pray you'll help us to, to, to let these truths find a place in our hearts, our souls, that they might grow and they might give us courage and strength in these dark times. Lord, that we can still be the light of the world. This world needs light. And, Lord, where they need the light of the, the light of the gospel to illuminate the past. So, Lord, let us be light bearers in a world of darkness. Father, we, want you, we need your strength. We need your mercy. We need your grace, O oh Lord. And we love you so much for, for all that you've done for us and all that you promised to do for us. So, Lord, we, we pray that I pray your blessing upon this class, that you touch our hearts, touch our souls, touch our bodies, and give us strength, health, peace, life, and love, Lord. And we will give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.